part, we will hear from Dr. Robert Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, and Dr. Susan Fila, Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing, to talk about campus health and safety. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, first staff town hall of the new school year. And I thought I would um, just kick things off with a general overview of where things are going with the pandemic here in the US and then uh, turn things over to Dr. Fila to talk a bit about the um, situation on campus. Uh, this is a depiction that many of you have seen before that just shows the waves of uh, COVID activity we've been through over the last couple of years. And as you can see on the right of the slide, we're coming down uh, from a little summer burst of infections with a subvariant of the Omicron uh, strain of um, SARS-CoV-2 called BA5. And things have gotten down to a point in the US that they're about as quiet as they were late in the spring after our really busy um, period of December and January. Next slide. California almost mirrors the United States uh, exactly. Uh, you can see that we're at a relatively quiet period here in California as well. Next slide. When you look at the national map, uh, this is the new way the CDC has been telling us about their perception of our county risk. It includes a combination of metrics uh, such as number of cases, hospital bed availability, and um, vaccination levels. And what you can see is that over the last couple of weeks, uh, counties that were previously yellow and orange in California have now all, except for a couple of uh, exceptions, turned green. Uh, and indeed, much of the rest of the country uh, is moving in that direction. And this has been the trajectory we've been on really since the uh, first part of August when the summer wave began to abate. So again, in summary right now, things look reasonably good at the national level. Next. Here in San Diego, our hospitalization rate has uh, gradually drifted down uh, over the last month. We're down now so that the on an average day, about 190 to 200 people with HIV infection are in the hospital, uh, which is down from almost 500 um, at the summer peak. Uh, again, a trend in the right direction. Next slide. Looking forward, uh, as we often do using the uh, Point Loma wastewater as an indication of how much SARS-CoV RNA is being shed in the community. What you can see is again, just like the case rates in blue, the in blue the RNA levels are declining as well. The RNA rates are in blue, as I keep perseverating here. And you can see we've come down from a peak in, in the eighteen to twenty million copy per day range or copy per liter range to a. Uh, level in the four to five million copy uh, range over the last couple of weeks, which is a trend in the right direction, suggests that the uh, ongoing um, case trajectory uh, will not uh, change much, at least over the next several weeks. Next. And this is a, another graphic that looks at the same issue. This is a way of calculating how many new cases on average come from each case of COVID. And we can see here for San Diego County, uh, on average, the uh, model suggests that each person infects not quite one new person. So we're in a situation now where the case rate is reasonably stable. Next. The one concern we have is that we're beginning to see a shift in the uh, variants that are circulating uh, in uh, San Diego and indeed in the world. If you look at the pink uh, and the tan at the uh, extreme right of the slide, you can see that the fraction of sequences of virus in the wastewater comprised of the BA4 and BA5 strains that caused the summer uh, burst uh, is currently about 91%. But if you look up in the upper right, you can see a new little um, purple uh, wedge beginning to appear uh, with the um, uh, designation BF7. This is a new strain of, of, um, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 that has begun to, to, uh, tra to uh, uh, be transmitted in Europe. It now makes up about 25% of the cases uh, in Belgium and about 10% in Germany and France. It is beginning to push BA4 and 5 out of the way in Europe. Next. Uh, this is the CDC uh, depiction of what's going on in the U.S. as a whole. And what you can see here, just at the upper part of the right, now depicted in kind of a light green, BA7 is beginning to push down 
on the uh, former dominant variants BA4 and BA5. And finally, next. And what you can see here uh, is that, uh, again, looking at the CDC data starting in the Northeast, uh, the pie chart, you can see the light green pie um, piece of the pie chart, BA7, takes a very small part of New England, and you can see an even smaller part, if you look over uh, in California, of our region. And this is the pattern we've generally seen as new strains come along. They first are introduced into the Northeast and gradually move West. So the concern we have is that BA7 uh, is beginning to replace BA4 and 5 uh, as we get ready for the winter uh, and come indoors and something we're going to be watching as we continue to uh, think about uh, the approach to, um, to COVID mitigation. We don't yet have direct data about how the new BA4 and uh, BA4-5 hybrid vaccine protects against BF7, but some indirect evidence that a colleague of mine in New York has generated from people who've recovered from BF, uh, BA4 and 5 suggest that there is a significant amount of cross-reactivity. So that people who get this hybrid vaccine now will be helping themselves in terms of protection from BF7. But we'll be watching that and we'll continue to update you in these town halls and elsewhere as we move forward. Let me turn this now over uh, to Dr. Susan Filar, our new um, uh, newest member of our team. She is now the uh, director of the Student Health Service and I'd like to welcome her to UC San Diego. Thank you, Chip. Uh, appreciate being here and uh, thank you to all the other panelists for having me. Can I ask you to turn it to the next slide? Okay, so uh, just wanted to give you a picture of our COVID-19 test positivity rates. Uh, if we look at San Diego County, you can see the positivity rate for our county residents compared to our UC San Diego students, which remains relatively low. Uh, and if we look at our UC San Diego employees, we're hovering at or below the positivity rates for UC, or for, sorry, for San Diego County residents. So um, really good pictures here, hoping to see uh, continued declines on campus. Next slide, please. If we look at COVID-19 cases among UC San Diego students by week, uh, you could see the blue line are our on-campus cases. The orange line are our off-campus cases with the gray, the total. We did a, a large amount of testing for our students moving into campus. So you can see relatively low numbers. Next slide, please. And if you look at the left, this is a chart for our move-in student daily tests. So large number of students were tested as they were moving in, um, obviously less as move-in uh, declined. And then to the right, you'll see our student new cases. So again, relatively low numbers of students testing positive both on campus and off campus. And of course, if our students do test positive, uh, they are isolating. Uh, and there's a variety of different uh, ways in which students can isolate to uh, keep them and their communities safe. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at the left slide, this is actually looking at a variety of different metrics. Uh, there's, you can see campus case rates, residential student case rates, campus residential wastewater, and a variety of different metrics and response levels. So the green is sort of what we're calling our new normal. Response level of yellow looks at kind of a limited response. And then red looks at more full response. So obviously we wanna be as close to the green as possible. Red are areas that we're really concerned about. Kind of overall, we're doing pretty well, um, but two things I wanna point your attention to, obviously the red, right, is generally where our eyes go. So if we look at wastewater, so down at the bottom, San Diego County wastewater, which you'll see is red currently. That data actually hasn't been updated. Um, it's actually going to be posted as yellow. Uh, this is data from last week. You'll see uh, 928. And so uh, we'll update that and reflect it and, it, and it'll be um, more in the limited response range. And if you look at the campus residential wastewater percent positive just above that, which is also red, um, one of the things that's important to know is that um, we are testing wastewater in buildings where our students are also positive and isolating. And so we are seeing an overrepresentation of students 
um, who are positive and there's wastewater collected there as well. So just some caution when we're uh, looking at this chart. Next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder on our vaccination booster, this is our UCOP mandate, there have been no changes. So again, what does it mean to be fully vaccinated? It's been seven days since you've had your booster dose or your initial vaccine series and you're not yet eligible for a required booster. You're not fully vaccinated if it's been less than seven days or you've received your, your complete first um, vaccine dose and you're past due for your booster. So time has lapsed and your booster is due. Um, you know, another area where you're not fully vaccinated is an individual um, who has not completed a full series uh, or you have not been vaccinated at all. Next slide, please. Uh, and then more on boosters and the UCOP mandate. So the first dose of boosting when you are eligible is required under the mandate, uh, but the second dose is not required under the mandate. Another important thing to note is that currently the new bivalent booster is not required under the mandate, but we are recommending it. Um, and you are eligible for the bivalent two months after your prior doses um, or prior COVID infection excuse me, prior COVID infection um, if you're over the age of 18. And then after becoming eligible, uh, it's time to boost before uh, you reach that sort of non-compliance period under the mandate, right? So that's pretty important. So for campus employees and students, there's a 30-day grace period to get uh, your uh, booster information in. If you've recently been infected with COVID-19, um, Keep in mind, if, uh, if we have your positive results, that's incredibly helpful. So that would be an EPIC or COEM, right? So if we're aware, um, then your eligibility date does extend. So there's an additional grace period of 90 days, okay? And then uh, currently approved exemptions do also cover boosters. Uh, and I do want to let you know boosters are available in the rec gym. I actually got my booster last Thursday. It was a very smooth process. Um, it's a it's a, a easy walk and, and a lovely place to be. There's music playing and you get to meet some of our amazing uh, team members who are giving the booster. Next slide, please. So looking at testing requirements, uh, surveillance testing for our unvaccinated and those who are not up to date is not required. So for individuals who are not vaccinated and they have an exemption, we are no longer doing testing. And this is for students and staff. Um, I also wanna let you know that residential undergraduate move-in went really, really well. We had low positivity rates uh, and we were testing uh, using a PCR test for undergraduate students upon arrival. Um, just a reminder, and, and I, this is, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but when should you test? Uh, individuals should test if they have symptoms. This is regardless of vaccination status. Um, if you do have symptoms, always good to mask, mask, mask. Very important to slow the spread. Um, if you've had an exposure, right? It's really important if you've had an exposure to test um, initially, uh, you also want to test at day five, again, regardless of vaccination status. Um, if you're looking at the wastewater, right, indications that your building has a positive uh, signal, it's really important to test, again, regardless of vaccination status. Um, if you've had a recent COVID infection uh, and you also have new symptoms and it's been more than 30 days, it's important to test. Um, and other times it's important to test is uh, recent travel, uh, or you're going to be near uh, vulnerable individuals, obviously large events, things like that. Um, in terms of vending machines, uh, we do have vending machines throughout campus. Um, so you can uh, submit uh, test results and, and, and send them. Just make sure that when you are submitting your test results uh, through the uh, vending machine that you're capturing the barcode. Um, that's incredibly important. And we wanna make sure that we uh, capture, um, you know, everyone who's who's uh, sending in a test. Um, and then also uh, do not use your identity for others to test. Uh, and then just recommendation if you want your results early to drop off before 2 p.m. Next slide, please. Masking requirements. So masking is just really effective in reducing transmission. We all know this. 
Um, we always recommend a KN95 or N95 if you have access. Uh, departments can order these through Oracle. Uh, alternative to KN95 or N95, um, you can always use a surgical mask with a cloth covering, so sort of double masking. And masking is still required in places like classrooms, clinical settings, so uh, student health services, CAPS, Price Center, and campus transportation. And then, you know, I've mentioned this again, masking is recommended, it's encouraged, um, just generally indoors, uh, outside your personal office, uh, and uh, in crowded settings, especially uh, when you'll be around others uh, for a prolonged period of time. Next slide, please. Uh, isolation requirements, so just some uh, CDC guidance around isolation. Um, it's really important if you are testing positive that you isolate for at least five days. We want to make sure that you have a, a negative test. Uh, if you're symptomatic, uh, remain in isolation. But if you're not symptomatic after day five, you can take a rapid antigen test. And if you test negative, you may end your isolation, again, as long as you're symptom-free, um, but your masking should continue until you have two negative rapid antigen tests 48 hours apart, uh, and this is, again, after day five. And then, of course, um, if you don't take those two negative rapid antigen tests, you want to make sure that you're masking for um, at least a full 10 days. Uh, and then in terms of employment, a picture of a rapid antigen test result after five days, along with your campus ID, uh, is very important for us. Next slide, please. Uh, quarantine, just uh, some reminders on that. The date of exposure is day zero, so that's when you start counting. And you want to mask around others for at least 10 days, monitor for symptoms, and then test um, upon notification that you were exposed, and then day five after exposure. Next slide, please. And then just a reminder, the daily symptom screener, so the green thumb is telling us that we are allowed on campus. Uh, we've had no symptoms or exposures. The yellow is always telling us that we are allowed on campus, but we've been exposed, and so we have to just do take some extra measures, follow safety protocols like masking and eating alone. And then the red is telling us we are not allowed on campus, either we're symptomatic or we were exposed and unvaccinated or not up to date with our vaccination status. And with that, I will turn it over to Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schooley and Dr. Fila. We really appreciate you for your helpful guidance and up-to-date information. Next, we'll hear a um, here are HR updates from Terry Winbush, our Chief Human Resources Officer. Thank you, Iman. Next slide. So uh, I want to give you again some reminders uh, related to COVID-19 and just in general, uh, if you're not feeling well, because I think um, it always bears reminding um, you all, please do not ignore symptoms and come to work sick. Um, leaves are available. Um, the emergency paid sick leave I'll get to in just a minute um, was extended through the December of this year. There's still cow OSHA leave at least through December of this year. If you have sick leave accruals, you can use those, but do not come to work sick. And I don't mean sort of our assessment of coming to work sick pre-COVID, uh, where you came to work even if you had the sniffles, you came to work even if you had a sore throat, you came to work when you were feeling run down and completely under the weather, I, I don't mean that assessment. I mean the assessment that we've managed ourselves through this pandemic um, so well with, which is if you are having symptoms that could infect someone else, even if you do think it's just the common cold, stay away from the work site and also wear a mask around um, people. If you are all out of leave options, please work with your local HR partner and contact uh, Campus HR um, if necessary, and we can provide some support. If you test positive, uh, please report your positive test as soon as possible. And if you test it outside of UCSD or via a rapid test, the new process includes uploading a photo of your result directly to my UCSD chart. So before you throw away the little stick, as I know you probably do, um, take a picture of it, 
so that you can upload it into my chart um, and, and make sure that they can uh, document it uh, for your records. Also make sure to do the symptom screener and follow the guidance um, that's provided by the symptom screener, which will include quarantining yourself if you have tested positive. Um, and if you have questions, the testing support line is still there. Um, and thank goodness they have continued to support us um, through this time and answered all of the difficult questions around um, COVID. Uh, as um, uh, Susan mentioned, asymptomatic testing requirements are going away if you have an exemption or pending exemption to the vaccine mandate. So for those of you who were accustomed to engaging in your twice a week testing, no more than uh, five days apart and no less than three days apart and, you know, doing that dance. Um, and if you were hybrid, you were trying to figure out what was the best schedule. You do not have to do that anymore. You are not required to engage in the asymptomatic, te asymptomatic testing. Um, our symptom screener is being updated to reflect this change. So um, I don't know that if that's been completed yet, but I know it's coming any day now. Uh, but remember, you still can do asymptomatic testing. Um, so you have access to our vending machines. There's more than 20 of them on site. Uh, and you can make an appointment for a provider uh, administered test, uh, another fancy way of saying someone doing it for you. Uh, next slide. So uh, also as Susan mentioned, there has been no change to the UC COVID vaccine mandate. Um, the first dose boosting when eligible is still required under the mandate. If you'll remember that was rolled out at the very early part um, of this year, uh, as far as being part of the mandate, and it was um, accessible as of the end of last year. Um, but again, our goal is compliance and not discipline. And so we know that some of you may have waited to get your booster because you were waiting for the bivalent booster. And that booster will count towards you being boosted as it relates to the mandate. But if you've already had your first booster, the mandate does not take into account a second booster as a mandated requirement yet. So if that changes, we will let you know. But as of right now, um, we are at status quo on that. But don't forget, you do have access to the bivalent booster. Um, the, the new Pfizer or Moderna bivalent vaccines are available through our UC San Diego Health Partners. Um, for our campus employees. You can schedule an appointment online for either the La Jolla Medical Center drive-up location or at the rec gym, um, as Susan was mentioning, or your preferred provider. You can go to CVS, you can go to Kaiser, you can go to wherever, just go uh, to get uh, vaccinated. Um, and you can also get your seasonal uh, influenza vaccine at the same time uh, if you go to, actually a number of the providers in the community are allowing you to schedule both at the same time as well. So the key is to get yourself protected. Um, many people have asked, and so I'm here to tell you the flu vaccine will be a requirement again this year. So more details will be coming soon. We're trying to make it um, a very simple access and engagement process. Um, like it was last year where you kind of just went on to um, uh, ServiceNow and you selected that you had gotten your flu vaccine on whatever date or that you were not going to get your flu vaccine, but you had the information in front of you to make an informed decision. Um, we're looking to do something very sim sim similar to that, um, but maybe even simpler. So we're working on it and we'll uh, keep you posted. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, the emergency paid sick leave was extended. We just found this out on either Thursday or Friday of last week. Um, so the emergency paid sick leave was extended to December 31st of this year. But keep in mind, there was not a new allotment of hours. So the original 80 hours that was extended or the prorated amount, if you work less than 100% time, um, that's still the same amount that's been allotted. But if you haven't used all of your allotment, and something comes up where you would be eligible to use the time, you now have through December 31st to use that time. So uh, that is um, warm off the presses at this point because in, you know we're a few days after it now. Um, I also wanted to say uh, a lot of the thank yous that I put on the slide um, related to the staff at work survey efforts. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I really, really, really mean it. And I'm really excited to see um, the feedback that you provided, whether positive, negative, or uh, ambivalent. I, I really just want to know um, how all of you are out there doing um, in your departments, in your units, et cetera. Um, I really appreciate the participation. Our percentage this year was up four percentage points over last year. So I will take it and I'm going to go for even higher numbers next year. So I'm hoping that you'll be um, 
on that journey with us. So the next steps, as we mentioned on the last town hall, for um, the staff at work survey information and as part of our yellow brick road approach, if you will. Um, so our hard working partners in OSI, uh, the Triton Lytics team will be reviewing the data, giving us a, um, an assessment of our strengths and opportunities. And then we're going to be coming back out to you um, through an idea wave campaign so we can learn from you what actions you believe would be um, beneficial to capitalize on our strengths and address our opportunities um, to make your employment experience uh, that much better. So stay tuned, uh, hang in there. And um, thank you again for those of you who took the time to do it because I know it's an additional thing to do, but that feedback is so critically important. Um, one thing I'll also note, because I know this um, question always comes up as well, and I mentioned it last town hall, is what happens with those verbatims? Like if I make notes like, I really love my boss, he's super great. I wish that everybody had a boss like him. Um, where does that go? Well, to some degree, um, if it is something that can be identifiable, et cetera, the verbatims all come to my office and particularly they come to me. And if um, one of our senior leaders is requesting access to the themes or thematic information around those verbatims, we actually pull them within my um, HR team to sanitize that information so that it can't be attributed to one person, but more the concepts for that group so people can understand where um, there are opportunities um, or, or, or abilities to capitalize on things that are, are, are really great. If you do mention someone by name in a positive way, that's where that staff at work survey most mentions comes in. And we'll be celebrating those folks um, in the coming months so that you know who was most mentioned in a positive way. Next slide. So as a reminder, mark your calendars, open enrollment is coming. Uh, open enrollment will begin on Thursday, October 27th, and it will be open for open enrollment uh, through Friday, November 18th. Um, so this is the time of year where you can look at the, the kind of benefits um, that you currently have. And if you want to make changes, this is that time where there doesn't have to be sort of a life event um, to give you access to make adjustments. You can make those adjustments. So if you really now are thinking about getting some pet insurance for Sparky, this is the time that you can consider doing that and then um, uh, getting Sparky enrolled. If this is the time where you say, I've had enough, Sparky's gonna be on his own, you can get rid of the, um, the pet insurance for Sparky uh, during open enrollment. The staff mentorship program. So I mentioned this in the updates from HR. I hope y'all are reading those. Um, but if you are interested in serving as a mentor, and please, please be interested. People, people need your knowledge. People need your, your advice, your guidance, your strength, your ability to navigate the complex system known as the UC. Um, please apply online by visiting mentorship.ucsd.edu. Um, the mentor applications are always open because um, we can never get enough people to help those folks who are um, open and honest enough to request a mentee because we all need support. It's just there's only like the, the so many people who actually go out and ask for it. Um, and then another reminder about the per public service loan forgiveness program for student loans. Um, last month, uh, or actually now I guess it's August, um, UC sent out information and hosted a webinar about the PSLF. That's easier for me to say than the whole phrase again. And the time limited waiver that um, uh, expands access to the loan forgiveness for many borrowers. And that goes through October 31st of this year. So if you have student loans and in the past, your loans didn't qualify or your payment amounts didn't qualify, or maybe your former employer didn't qualify, take a look at it again because what you don't wanna do is miss out on an opportunity to have thousands and thousands of dollars in student loan debt forgiven. It can make a huge difference in your life. So just take a look at um, uh, that webpage that um, uh, Amy posted in the chat. Thank you, Amy. Um, and see if you qualify so that you can try and have some of your loans forgiven because um, it, like I said, it can make a huge difference in your life. Next slide. So some of you may have seen the announcement that our Star Award program for 2022 to 2023 was approved. The Star Awards, as many of you know, um, is a tool to recognize exceptional contributions among policy covered and our clerical unit CX represented staff employees. Um, more information can be found employee incentive award program page, but this is a good time of year where 
you know, you go through and you take a look and, and many departments do this throughout the, the entire fiscal year. So it doesn't have to happen this week and, you know, don't make judgments if it doesn't um, for, for those areas across the campus. But for the, for the folks who really have been doing exceptional work or some teams that have been doing phenomenal work, this is an opportunity to provide an additional um, incentive award to them um, to, to say thank you. Uh, because, you know, the words thank you, they are very valuable and important and you should say them. Uh, but also sometimes if you can reward people a little bit in their checkbook, it goes a long way, even if it's just enough to buy a couple of Starbucks coffees. Um, that's just for me. Um, and then Grace, uh, you know, I have talked to a few people over the last um, month and a half or so since our last town hall. And um, some people have shared that while they are hearing the, the, the phrase grace being used and giving grace, and um, some people are actually checking in on their employees, are they really checking in or is it performative? Are they doing it to just say, I checked in on the person, but then they don't actually internalize the information that's being shared with them so that it can actually benefit the experience that they're having with their employee. And so I wanted to take some time to say to you all, like, please truly check in and honor the sharing that people um, engage with, um, with you in. So are you checking in on your employees and colleagues in a non-performative way? Meaning when you say, how are you doing? How are things going? When they tell you, are you taking that into account? Are you doing um are you doing something to show that you've understood what they've shared with you and are you making any changes on how you engage with them based on what they've shared with you whether it's positive or negative um are you putting intentional effort into making sure people feel seen and heard and you know i know that's a phrase that people use often but it it matters when you hear something from them and you make a change because of that, because it truly did impact you listening to this thing that they've shared with you. And it could be something as simple as, you know, um, no one truly understands the work I do. I hear that sometimes. And so then I say, can you tell me what it is that you do? And then I've I've been on, I've been known to say on occasion, well, the reason why people don't know what you do is because what you do is so nuanced and specific and creative they probably don't know how to describe it. So how would you describe what you do to those who, you know, aren't as special? <laughs> and then you go and share that with others so that they know uh, the important work that's being done in all pockets across the organization. Um, when someone shares something important to you, do you take that into account as you engage with them going forward? And then just one, one suggestion, and I, it came up as we were doing our own planning for um, a collaboration event for, for our HR staff. Make sure you, that you're providing space for team building that supports both your introverts and extroverts. Very often people plan together events and it's very much like being around, being around people, being around people. And for introverts, that can be utterly and completely exhausting exhausting. And then it takes away from even coming together all together. So make space where smaller groups can come together. When we even talked about um, having a, a meditation space or a space where people can go and have like just quiet time for 15 minutes, just enough to sort of recharge. I personally, when I'm around a lot of people, it's like plugging me into a light socket. That's how I function. But on the flip side of the spectrum, because I'm as E as you can go in an extrovert, um, are our introverts who the way they recharge is quiet time alone. So we need to honor that because we do have the full spectrum of our employees within our own teams and the way to best really build um, uh, connection, collaboration and engagement with them is to actually recognize who they are as a whole employee when they show up to work. So um, just think about that in your planning. Just wanted to make that one suggestion. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it back over. I think that's my last slide. I'm going to turn it back over to Iman for our next presenters. Is that right? That's right, Terry. Thank you so much. Uh, we, you, as you know, we always love hearing your useful HR updates, your words from the heart, and the inspiration to give feedback about making our work lives that much better. So thank you. Next, we will hear a few updates from our staff association chair, Desiree Hennon. Take it away. 
Awesome. Thank you, Iman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here again this month. Give you a little update on the Staff Association and the work we've been doing through KUKSA. So next slide, please. So KUKSA is a Council of UC Staff Assemblies, shortened to KUKSA. Um, it's a UC-wide assembly of staff that's dedicated to improving communications between UC staff and administrators. The council's objective is to provide service to the university by advising and providing a staff perspective to decision makers. The council meets quarterly and includes two delegates from each campus, the Office of the President, Agriculture and Natural Resources, and the Berkeley Lab. This year's San Diego delegates are myself as the staff association chair and our chair-elect Roberta Camarena. We're also proud to have our immediate past chair, Jen Bowser, as the current KUKSA operations officer. Next slide. And that's a picture of us at our most recent meeting up at UC Irvine. Um, through KUKSA, we communicate about matters affecting staff, such as benefits, change management, diversity, wellness, and engagement. This year, we're focusing on all things related to retention, as you've heard me say and seen me write in many of my updates um, in this changing and challenging employment landscape. Um, so again, the photos from our most recent meeting in UC Irvine, where we were able to meet with leaders on campus, including their chancellor and their chief human resource officer, as well as many other leaders from campus that came to our meetings and also our little afternoon um, dinners. Uh, it was an exciting time to be able to meet with colleagues at other locations and to work on advocacy for staff as a system-wide team. Next slide, please. KUKSA leadership is focusing on engaging a greater staff population. That's one of the big focuses for this year um, through connection and training events. KUKSA town halls will continue to be held and hopefully some of you have logged on to those. They're very interesting. Um, they're held the week after we have our quarterly meetings. So the last one was um, the second week of September. Uh, they're held via Zoom and they are recorded. So you can always go back and watch them. Uh, it includes updates on current initiatives and also updates from our working groups and the progress we're making within those groups. We also introduced this year the KUKSA Chats. This year, um, it's a way to connect staff and share best practices. The KUKSA Chats, which you see on the screen there, and the next one's October 27th. They're really focused on different ways that you can use um, your time when you're giving back to different organizations and or just your time in your regular position at the UC um, to benefit your growth. So the next one is level up, how to leverage your campus service for professional development. Um, and we have a link in the chat that Amy has added um, that has all the information about upcoming KUKSA chats as well as information regarding the work that KUKSA is doing around retention this year. And then as always, watch for our monthly staff association email messages for more information on the next town hall, which will be in December, the second week of December after we have our quarterly meeting and for more information on future KUKSA chats. And now I'll pass it back to Iman to uh, focus on our shines and shout outs as we do every month. Take it away, Iman. Thank you, Desiree. So many amazing professional development opportunities. Appreciate that. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I would like to take a moment to actually spotlight and thank Sarah Andrade. Um, Sarah was the one who you'd see on the town halls actually doing the shine and shout outs, um, but Sarah has um, moved on to a new position outside of UC San Diego. Um, we're excited for her, but sad to lose her at UC San Diego. Um, but Sarah has been on our staff association MARCOM committee for the past two years, and um, we really wanted to just give her a major shout out. And um, if you want to read about all of the amazing things that she's done, um, go ahead and um, log into your Instagram and read about her and read about more shines and shout outs. You all have been doing an amazing job, by the way, submitting them. We have tons of them coming in and we love it and we want more. So please um, check it out. Um, next slide, please. Um, there is the follow us on Instagram. I know all of you are already following us on Instagram, but just in case you're not, there's the QR code. Um, and then you can also go to our website to submit a shine and shout out. And that actually brings us to 
Oh, and there's a link. Sorry, there's a link to the shines and shout outs in the chat. Um, but that brings us now to our Q&A time. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite all of our panelists to turn their videos on. And again, as you remember, during the town hall registration, staff had an opportunity to submit questions to the panelists. And we selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today. If you still have a question now, please use the Q&A window to submit additional questions during the session, and we hope to have time to address them all. All right, I need to look at our questions. Okay, actually. So the first question is for Dr. Schooley. Can you clarify the optimal timing of the bivariant booster, I probably pronounced that wrong, sorry, after having COVID or a previous vaccine dose? So what's that optimal timing like? We generally recommend two to three months after you've had your most recent exposure to the vaccine, to the virus either through a vaccination or through infection. This isn't because it's dangerous to get vaccinated earlier. It's just because um, during that period of time, your uh, immune system is continuing to process the um, viral antigen that, from the exposure that you had and mature so that when you do get boosted, you get a much bigger antibody and cellular immune response. So it's a way of having that vaccine count the most uh, by waiting that length of time. In that period of time as well, because you've recently uh, been infected or vaccinated, you're uh, relatively unlikely to have a breakthrough infection. So you're protected from having a new infection from your most recent experience. After that, uh, we don't think you get that much more immune maturation, and then you begin to be at increasing risk for having another breakthrough infection. So that's why we kind of recommend that two to three month sweet period spot. Perfect, thank you so much. Next question is for Pierre. With housing costs and inflation being such an issue, what is the university doing to retain and hire staff? Uh, it's a big question that <laughs> I'll try to answer it as, as uh, uh, succinctly as I can. But uh, I think there are two elements uh, to the answer. One is, of course, we are, uh, I was uh, answering some questions online where um, uh, trying to stay on top of uh, compensation, as you know, uh, quotas, uh, which are the cost of living uh, adjustments, um, uh, which are in the kind of four to five percent range right now, um, or decided at the system level. Uh, President Drake uh, makes a recommendation to the regions. Um, so uh, we have increased the uh, uh, the cost of living cost of living adjustments from the historical three percent to something uh, uh, closer to a four and a half five uh, for different um, uh, type of uh, employees. Um, we uh, also uh, look at um, equities on top of that at the campus level in areas where we feel that, that we're lagging. And of course, there is a lot of work around uh, employee retention and, um, and uh, talent acquisition as well. Um, on the housing front, uh, there is quite a bit going on, uh, which is kind of more uh, targeted and, and there'll be some communications coming up um, uh, shortly. but. What the campus is doing right now is um, starting to either acquire properties or acquire land or develop uh, some of the land that we have uh, to provide um, housing solutions that would be uh, rentals uh, for faculty and staff. Because uh, we don't see the uh, San Diego market uh, getting much better over the next few, few years, unfortunately. Uh, there may be a softening of the market right now, but San Diego is not building enough housing inventory uh, to meet what we uh, see the demand. I think San Diego builds about 10,000 units uh, a year. And uh, the city should probably build twice as much given the population growth. So it's a huge concern for us. Uh, we want to play a part. Uh, we just acquired uh, rental units downtown um, by the park and market um, uh, uh, site. Um, and we are uh, looking at acquisitions along the, uh, the uh, LRT, um, uh, the San Diego, San Diego line, uh, as well as on the La Roya campus and as well on the Hillcrest campus. And the idea would be uh, to acquire or build rental units and uh, turn around and run them out at cost uh, to faculty and staff. So 
it will not be, uh, maybe we use this counter market that people hope for because uh, we need to recover our cost, uh, but we certainly would be at, at the lower end of market. So that's a, a new strategy that uh, we are quite excited about. Uh, I think it will uh, help the university uh, more and more over time. It's a little bit like what um, uh, NYU or other universities did uh, kind of way back when. And uh, uh, over time, as the market uh, grew and uh, appreciated, and they became more they became more and more attractive to faculty and staff. So we're we're starting to be in that game. Um and uh kind of more to come on that front as well. So short answer to the question, uh trying to remain as competitive as we can on series, it's not easy. I appreciate that. Um and uh really creating a portfolio of options uh for uh, uh rents. Uh again, won't meet the needs of everyone, uh, but for some of our uh faculty and staff. It may be a welcome option um, and more to come on that. Thank you so much. The next question is for Dr. Scully and Dr. Fila. Quote, I'm tired of driving. How safe is taking public transportation now? Well, it depends on uh, how good the driver of the bus. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the um, the uh, public transportation uh, is reasonably safe. I am still wearing a mask when I'm on a plane, uh, except when I'm eating or something. But uh, I think that um, we're at a relatively low point in the uh, pandemic. Uh, the um, uh, And I would feel comfortable riding a bus, but I'd probably still throw a mask on just because there's so many people on it. Good advice. All right, next question is for you, Terry. We, we received a number of questions about whether flu shots are going to be required this year. And we heard in presentations that they would be. Can you tell us about the timing and process? Yes, yeah, so um, as I shared in the presentation, we're working on making the process even simpler than it was last year. And we're working with our um, health partners to try and have a streamlined approach. So there's sort of one place where all of the information is stored and maybe it'll all just be through my chart and you won't have to figure out a new system to work through, but we're working on it. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just note for the record, I am not an IT expert. I rely on those who are and they're amazing partners, um, but they're, they're working on it. As far as timing, um, I expect within the next couple of weeks, you'll hear some information. Um, because we have the sort of draft joint um, vaccine policy that are um, that is being circulated uh, for commentary and things right now. So there's the the COVID vaccine mandate, and then there's the sort of flu vaccine opt out, and there's like the two dimensions of the different types of um, approaches. And so what we're trying to do is reconcile the best way to streamline all of that information because it's, it was a big. Uh, work effort for a number of folks, and there are a number of things going on, and we want to maximize the use of um, our folks' time and your um, your efforts uh, as the employee engaging in these processes. So stay tuned. We're going to try and make it simple. If it is not, though, don't hold it against me, because I will be going through it just as much as you. Good point. All right. Next question is for Dr. Fila. Will we be able to get vaccinated for monkeypox at UC San Di as UC San Diego students, staff, and faculty like we did for COVID? Yes, that's a good question. Um, uh, and being new, I, I did pose this question to Dr. San Miguel, um, who's here. So I want to give credit. Um, staff can get their uh, staff who get their health care at UC San Diego Health are able to get their uh, mpox vaccine at UC San Diego. Um, staff who are followed uh, elsewhere should go through their primary care providers uh, to get their health care. And we are working to get the MPOX vaccine here on campus. So stay tuned. We'll send out communication uh, so that students will be able to come and there'll be plenty of outreach uh, to make sure that students have access to the vaccine on campus. Great. That's wonderful news. Um, the next question is for you again, Pierre. What capital projects are on the horizon? 
Uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'll start with what's not on the horizon is to build more office space with hybrid. Uh, this is really where we're trying to be more effective with what we have today and uh, saving money and not renting a space of campus anymore. Um, what we're building though is, um, I would say, uh, four types of uh, projects. Uh, um, Two are very focused on students. So the biggest expansion right now, as you see the cranes on the campus, is student housing. Um, it's uh, we invest a lot. We recover the cost over time uh, through the uh, the rents uh, paid by the students. But th there is a very significant push. So um, you can see the cranes on the theater district. They began learning um, by the La Jolla Playhouse, two thousand beds coming uh, in uh, um, uh, next year, actually. Uh, uh, phase delivery uh pepper canyon uh, west uh by the train station uh, amphitheater uh the year after 1400 beds and we're working on the redevelopment of marshall lowers uh by the geyser library uh which will be a very exciting development as well another 2000 beds um and there'll be more after that we uh we, we need to be able to offer for your guarantee to our students so um that's the probably the, the largest uh investment right now. Uh, two, uh, student resources. Uh, some of you uh, may know that uh, we're seeing approval for the Triton Pavilion, which will be a redevelopment and welcome center at the heart of the campus with a lot of student resources. We have added so many students right now, they need uh, more space for their support, health and wellness, transfer students, uh, teaching and learning comments, and so forth. Um, the uh, other investments, uh, uh, the big need uh, right now is wet labs uh, for the research enterprise. So there is a project going on uh, on the medical side um, uh, with ophthalmology called the VTAB Vision Center. Uh, that's on East Campus, but there will be a lot of wet labs there. Um, and we just got the green light from the chancellor to work on a, a multidisciplinary uh, research building for the campus that will be in school medicine uh, precinct. Uh, but open to um, any uh, PI on campus. So I think biology will be a stakeholder as well. Uh, that's important there. And last but not least, even though that may be less relevant for a lot of folks on the call, a lot of clinical uh, expansion, uh, and that's covered by the health uh, system. So a lot going on there. Hillcrest renewal, for those of you uh, us, uh, living close to Hillcrest, um, outpatient and parking being built in the first phase. Um, and then a lot of clinical expansion across the San Diego County. Uh, there is a medical office building being built in Rancho Bernardo. And the idea is to uh, really continue to improve access uh, to our, our patients and to our faculty and staff that are, are served by UC San Diego Health. So these are the, the four key area, uh, areas of expansion, student resources, student housing, uh, wet labs, and uh, clinical. Thank you. It's amazing to see the the towers going up at eighth uh, eighth college coming soon. Uh, next question is for you again, Terry. I think you're going to like this one. How do we ensure people don't come in sick to on site work? I'm high risk and concerned, especially with COVID leaves coming to an end soon. Well, I think when that question was submitted, the person probably didn't know that the COVID leaves are being extended through December 31st. So that's that's part number one. But part number two is, you know, we're all adults and we have to manage ourselves um, in accordance with sort of our human responsibilities to take care of ourselves, but not to put our colleagues and coworkers and things like that at risk. Um, if you are unwell, you shouldn't come to work. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Um, some people ask the question, well, how sick is too sick? Well, that's to some degree a judgment call. Uh, and it also might depend on what your definition of sick is because that's a broad spectrum. If you, um, if you have an injury, but an injury that doesn't prevent you from doing the, the fundamental um, parts of your job, that's still considered sort of sick in your health, but you still can come to work and do your job. If you have seasonal allergies, and you know you have seasonal allergies and you've tested negative and you follow the advice of the testing support line, you can come on site and you should wear a mask though, just in case you are on day two before you would test positive on that day three. This is why we still strongly encourage masking, right? Um, 
Don't eat in enclosed spaces with other folks if you aren't necessarily sure. But it's a judgment call. I can't give you a checklist on exactly what to do. But what I can say is, if you wear your mask and are taking the proper precautions, things should work out like they're supposed to work out. But you know, we do all have a, a, a responsibility to our fellow humans to to take care. Um, and people have to remember that's sort of a fundamental sort of outside the workplace type of responsibility that just should also bleed into the workplace. Well, your answer was an excellent segue to the next question. So keep your mic on. <laughs> um, right. What will masking requirements and recommendations on campus be for the rest of the year? What about booster mandates? Uh, so the crystal ball question, like it, uh -huh, uh -huh, I like it a lot. Um, so in my crystal ball, uh, my crystal ball says, uh, you will have to wait for further information, um, because we are following the science. I mean, I, you know, I thank God that we have partners like Chip Schooley and now Susan has joined us and we, um, have Stacy and we've, you know, we've had Dr. Sosha and, you know, all of the partners that we've, we've had the, what I like to call access to, um, I know, you know, they very much feel it's part of their jobs, but I feel very much like I have access to them. And, and I know my mom feels very much that same way about Chip uh, in particular. Um, but the key is, is, is they're following the science. They're looking at updated information on a daily, sometimes minute, and then weekly basis to make recommendations to leadership on what needs to happen across the campus. We've been really lucky. Things are starting to look amazing. Um, even um, as Susan was saying, looking at the most updated wastewater numbers that would be at the yellow, even though it was presenting as red before. That's wonderful. And because we have been taking the necessary steps, we are able to reap the benefits of those necessary steps and have certain things relaxed. But don't fret if things start to go dark, we will make the necessary adjustments because what we don't want is to impact each other, but also the, the county and areas around us because we aren't taking the necessary steps. So uh, I don't know is the short answer to that um, very short question uh, and after my very much longer answer, but, um, but we will keep you posted as necessary on any changes that need to occur. Okay, keep, keep your mic on. All right. More for Terry. What is, <laughs> what is being done to address pay equity between VC areas? That's a great question. So number one, there's a lot of coordination that happens between the, the VC areas um, uh, with our partners um, in health sciences and health systems. There's a lot of coordination. We have regular meetings. We do have a central office that um, uh, helps to guide and advise related to um, compensation ranges, current market pay, things of that nature. So there's a lot of a lot of things being done around that. There's a lot of um, education being provided to to think differently about our approach to compensation, and there'll be more to come over the next several months around sort of our compensation philosophy for the campus. But the key for us, and I think, um, you know, I I love it most when I hear Pierre say it. We want to pay our folks correctly. Um, because they're the they're the backbone of the great work that we do at UC San Diego, right? And so we're we're very much um, sort of espousing that 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 ideal. Now, I say all that to say, I hear and a, a number of my partners hear about how someone poached, you know, that poach phrase, poach someone from one VC to the other, or one supervisor to the other, or whatever the case may be. And often the easy response by the employee is, oh, um, I got higher pay. Higher pay is an easier conversation to have than the uh, conflict written conversation of your supervisory style did not match with my growth needs within this organization or something along those lines. So most people don't wanna name it directly with the person that's causing that consternation but it really does matter who you are and who you show up as as a supervisor over these humans who are performing this really hard, complicated, important work. If they don't feel supported, if they don't feel guided, if they don't feel that that supervisor is removing obstacles for them and caring about them as a whole person, that enables them to go looking when they might not have otherwise went looking. So that is something that people need to keep in mind. Is there a reflection on me as a supervisor that my person's leaving, not just 
can I throw more dollars at it? Because you can throw more dollars at it. People do need to pay their mortgages. Those are real things. But at some point, the money isn't enough if they're still miserable or not feeling supported, heard, or valued within their work. So I want to make sure I say that because I'm having some of those conversations individually. But in this forum, people need to understand it's not just because you only have access to a 2% cap for the Star Awards versus a 3% last year. It's really about what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis to make people feel like they matter and are connected to our mission, which is to enable the education of our amazing students, the world-renowned research that we do, and to impact the lives of our amazing employees, our staff, um, our faculty, our academics, et cetera, across the 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 or UC San Diego. So all of that has to be taken into account. And there's a lot of collaboration going on related to salaries. All right. Well, thank you for that. And um, we have come to the time where we have one last question. And it is for you, Terry. <laughs> um, will staff still be able to work remotely? Oh, well, listen at that question. Mm. Um, so maybe. Uh, so the folks who are currently working remotely successfully and their supervisors and leaders support it. I don't know that there's a change on the horizon for, for um, uh, the negative in that um, perspective. For those folks who are currently not working remotely and who are looking for opportunities to do so, I think people need to understand that there's a lot of work kind of going on behind the scenes to help people think about our current world of work. Right. Like once upon a time, we talked about reimagining the workplace or the future of work and all of that. Well, it's here now, today. So the question is, is what's the best way to get our operational needs met while taking into account we have these whole humans who perform the work for us? And how can we structure our work hours, um, work schedules, the way that we provide services, et cetera, to take that into account for everybody who we serve, but also who's doing the surveying. Um, so people are people are starting to take those um, take those internal looks. But I I just ask to some degree for those of you employees who don't feel like your manager is moving fast enough, give them some time and some grace. They are probably very tired too. There are a lot of us who have taken on a lot of extra things um, the last couple of years. And as we start to shed it because we finally can fill vacancies or whatever the case may be, that does not immediately infuse you with energy. It immediately gives you an opportunity to finally go take that nap. Um, so then the next step after the nap is the dent to then plan differently and look differently and maybe reach out and seek some help from partners across the organization. Our partners in OSI help people with org design. HR has an org effectiveness domain that helps with org design. Your HR partner within your personal unit can help you with thinking about how you structure work. There's a lot of work to be done and there's a finite number of people. So give space and time and talk about it and be open to hear feedback around it. That's the, the, the biggest thing, but it is the world of now. How do we function in the world of now in a way that's gonna retain our top talent right? And make them understand that we value them completely. Um, and also attract in those places where we have vacancies, also attract top talent. And some of that will be locally. Some of it will be up and down the shores of California, and some of it might be out of state. Um, and having an open mind to that when it makes sense for the work that needs to be performed. So, okay. Thank you for enabling my soapbox today, Iman. I didn't know those were the questions, but I'm <laughs> Me to provide all of those answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, of course. And you're speaking my language, retaining <laughs> and attracting top talent. That's that's the business that I do. So yes, on all of that. Um, and we have come to the end of our time together today. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. I actually lost my screen, sorry. Um, thank you all for your questions. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that the recording, the final recording will be posted on the staff town hall page on Blink. So in case you missed part of it or for folks who had to leave a little early, um, <clears throat> and the link to that page is in the chat. Please stay tuned for news on the next staff town hall meeting. Um, we will be scheduled, we are scheduled for December 7th at 1030 to 1145. And again, you can register from that staff town hall page. And finally, I'd like to thank our presenters 
and guests for sharing their time and valuable information with us today. I'd also like to thank all of you, the staff of UC San Diego for attending this town hall and working together as a collective campus community. Please enjoy some the rest of your Tuesday <laughs> um, and um, we'll see you next time. Don't forget to join the uh, Instagram, more updates right there. <laughs>